And so, Lord Jesus, we pray now that you would help us to preach, to say what we just sang, and to believe it. Look, I, uh, preaching seems in, just insane to me because we have to talk about things that are so huge, so immense, so, so much bigger than, than our little brains. We have to talk about you. So, Lord God, even if we can't understand, would you help us to believe? In Jesus' name, amen. Long about uh, second grade, I learned about germs. In school, they, uh, they showed us these amplified pictures of these unseen entities invisible to the naked eye and yet deadly in their effect they feed on life and produce death I, I learned that germs lurked in uncleanness and decay and in the very height of all depravity human excretia and so I I began to wash my hands a lot I developed a system for using public restrooms, which I tried to avoid at all costs, but sometimes you just can't avoid it. I would place the toilet paper, you know, on the seat if I had to do the big job, all around the seat. Then I would uh, flush the toilet with my, with my foot. And then I would uh, walk out of the, the stall and find the sink that was closest to the door and I would uh, turn the faucet on, wash my hands and then make sure that I had a sanitary paper towel with which I then turned off uh, the faucet and then holding the towel, using the towel, I would open the door to the restroom, hold it open with my foot, dispose of the sanitary towel and then run out of there as fast as I could without touching anything that might have been touched by anyone that might have come into contact with human excretia. No touching. I washed often and, and I washed very, very, very well. But I never seemed to finish because you see I realized that I myself in fact was a producer of human excretia. And almost everyone that I knew was the same way. So I washed my hands a lot. I washed them a lot. And, and I was just driven to cleanliness. And within a few weeks, no kidding, I was driven to the doctor. Because I had washed my hands so much, that the soap and the water had chapped my hands until they finally like cracked open and became open, bleeding sores. They hurt. But even worse, they, they were now susceptible to germs, infection. I was worse off than when I had not the knowledge of germs. Remember the doctor just held my hand in his hand. He looked at my raw, broken, bleeding hands and he said, Stop washing your hands. Stop. He must have thought this kid is just neurotic. Well, the doctors worked with me. My parents worked with me. I remember one day walking out of my parents' bathroom. My dad was standing by the sink in, in, in his bathroom. And I was uh, fighting the good fight. And I remember I was just so excited about my victory. I looked up at my dad and I said, Dad, guess what? And he said, what is it, buddy? And I said, Daddy, I went number two and I didn't even wash my hands. I remember he looked down at me and said, oh, buddy. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> well, my hands healed. But I still lived in something of mortal terror over the idea that one day my mom might just ask me to clean the toilet or do some such things. You know, they say that Howard Hughes was neurotic about germs. And, and you know, Michael Jackson, he slept in a hyperbaric chamber. And I mean, you think about that's 
pretty weird. I mean, they had such control over their world, and yet they just couldn't seem to get clean. But, but is that neurotic? I mean, is that neurosis unfounded? Because we really do live in this world where we are surrounded by germs and infectious disease and deadly pathogens. The dark void of death is only a heartbeat away. Millions die of infectious disease every, every day. Excuse me, excuse me. Millions die of infectious disease every day. Uh, and yet, you know what? The, there may be something worse than germs, and that's the fear of germs. You know, they say that because of all our antibacterial soap and stuff, we're now developing strains of bacteria that could wipe out the human population. And check this out. Did you know that Howard Hughes died, they say, because he was worried about bacteria in his food? That's neurotic. Is God neurotic? You know, if you read the Old Testament, Levitical laws, you tend to think so. Uh, the Jews, uh, especially in Jesus' day, they must have thought so because they not only had the Old Testament laws, but they added a bunch of laws to them about hand washing and cleanliness. Deuteronomy 23, God gives Israel detailed instructions on how to poop <laughs> outside the camp. Why? Because God walks in the camp and God is holy. Holy. All sorts of laws on how to get clean when you're unclean throughout the Old Testament. And, and uh, that cleanliness, getting clean, usually involved more than just washing with water. It, it also involved blood. Hebrews 9.22. In, in fact says the author of Hebrews, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. The law. The law was given on Mount Sinai through Moses. But according to scripture, humans first learned about the law in a garden, at a tree. On the sixth day of creation, there they acquired the knowledge of good and evil and got neurotic. God instituted the sacrificial system, but, but even with all that blood, the blood of bulls and sheep and go goats and, and birds, that they just couldn't seem to get clean. You know, maybe human excretion is like a visible expression of a much deeper problem called sin. We talked about this several months ago, but you realize that this body of flesh of ours eats life and excretes death. Eats life and excretes death. I mean, that is a great description of sin. It's like our own bodily refuse is a constant reminder that no matter how hard we try to clean ourselves with ourselves, it is ourselves that are unclean. It, it's no wonder we're neurotic. And if you're not neurotic, you're probably insane. See, maybe I was really onto something in second grade. Washing and washing and washing and washing and, and never feeling clean, never done, never finished. May 2nd, 1507. A young German priest was officiating at his uh, first communion. Officiating at his first communion, and he was feeling uh, remarkably unclean. He got to the portion of the Mass where he was to say, We offer unto thee the living, the true, the eternal God. And, and, and he was terror-stricken. His father, Hans, uh, glared at him uh, in disapproval and disdain. The young monk began to tremble and shake. And in the process, he spilled some of the communion while he barely made it through the Mass. Later, he wrote this, At these words, living, true, eternal God, I was utterly stupefied and terror-stricken. 
Who am I that I should lift up my eyes or raise my hands to the divine majesty? At his nod the earth trembles. And shall I say, I want this, I ask for that? For I am dust and ashes and full of sin, and I'm speaking to the living, eternal, and true God. For the experience, he, he had a word, anfaktun in German. It describes this sense of anxiety, despair, shame, which he felt before God. He, he desperately tried to rid himself of Anfectun, but the harder he tried, the worse it seemed to get. The official stance of the church at the time was that at baptism, a, a person is forgiven of original sin. But after baptism, a person still needs to seek absolution through confession and penance for any sin that they happen to commit. Sins for which Christ must still suffer in the Mass. And, and so this young monk sought to cleanse himself each day in the confessional. One day he spent six hours in the confessional simply confessing the sins of the previous day. Now remember, he did not live in Las Vegas. He lived in a monastery. Six hours. Finally, his confessor yelled at him. He, he said, look here. If you expect Christ to forgive you, come in with something to forgive. Murder, blasphemy, adultery, instead of all these little sins. But you see, the young monk was trained classically as a lawyer. And he knew that it didn't matter, little or big. The punishment for sin was always death. And he reasoned that if the great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, then, then, then the great sin is to not love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But the harder he worked at loving God, the less he did. And so he could not get clean. And the sacrifice was never finished. And he could not give what God required, love. And as you probably realize... The name of that young monk was Martin Luther. Divinitatis, essay consortis. Father, please stay for supper. Father, your first mass, and you crap yourself. I hope we could talk. Too hard on yourself, Brother Marty. Arguing with the devil never does any of us any good. I'm sorry about today. I'm too full of sin to be a priest. You know, in two years I've never heard you confess anything remotely interesting. I live in terror of judgment. And you think self-hatred will save you? Have you ever dared to think that God is not just? He has us born, tainted by sin. Then he's angry with us all our lives for our faults. This righteous judge who damns us, <laughs> threatening us with the fires of hell. <sighs> I know, I know, I know I'm evil to think it. I wish there were no God. Love God, wrote Martin Luther. Love God. I hated him. And so his neurosis over sin caused him to commit mortal sin. Trying so hard to love God, he wanted to kill God. Crucify God, if you will. You know, many academics think that Martin Luther was mentally ill, that he was neurotic and anal retentive. In college at the University of Colorado, seriously, I had to write a paper on Eric Erickson and his theory. He was a psychohistorian. His theory that uh, Martin Luther uh, received his revelation, which sparked the prophet, Protestant Reformation because of a successful release on a toilet in the Wittenberg Tower, all related to potty training and pleasing his father. 
That's the reason for the Reformation. But you know, potty training really is kind of stressful. I mean, I, I remember so clearly peeking around the corner one day and seeing my firstborn son, Jonathan, talking to his stuffed animal, Bambi. Tears were streaming down his face as he said to Bambi, Bambi, I can't go pee-pee at the potty. Can you go pee-pee at the potty? We put a red fire truck on the back of the potty and told Jonathan, look, Jonathan, if you can do number two in the potty, you get the fire truck. We even wrote a little song that we'd sing to him every day. I'm proud of you, I'm proud of you, because you peeped in the potty. I'm proud of you, I'm proud of you, you certainly are a big boy. Rewards, approval ratings, and stress. Sometime later, uh, this may have been a year, two years later after John had experienced a d degree, a degree of success. I remember we were at Walmart one night, and Jonathan, he got all excited about some toy or something. He kind of, kind of lost track of what was going on, and he had an accident. In other words, he crapped himself. And, and I remember I was rather perturbed. I got angry, and, and, and I hope I never, ever forget this. I remember looking down at him, and he looked up at me with those big, beautiful eyes, and those eyes were filled with terror. On factoon. And he said, but, but Daddy, you're still proud of me, right? I hate on factoon. Especially my kids. You're still proud of me, right? Well, anyway, psychohistorians say that Martin Luther's real issues had to do with his father Hans and poop. But maybe his real issues were with his father God and and maybe Luther really wasn't insane, but he was more sane than anybody in Germany at the time. I mean, maybe his fear was not unfounded, but most founded. Maybe his unfecting wasn't losing touch with reality so much as just beginning to glimpse reality that God is holy and we are not holy and we cannot seem to make ourselves holy. In fact, the harder we try, the stinkier we get. And so Martin really did need some sort of release. If not before a toilet, before some sort of throne, on some sort of throne. And if you think that's, that's not your issue, understand Satan will hide sin from you. Just like germs are hidden from you. He'll hide sin from you in order that he might further infect you. He is the deceiver. And then, and then he'll expose the infection to you. He'll hide the sin from you and then he will expose the infection to you. He's the accuser and so he'll try to crush you with your own judgments, drivenness, despair until you thoroughly hate the God that you are required to love. And so how then? can we be saved? Well, Martin Luther had a revelation in the Wittenberg Tower, and we really don't know how much of it happened on a, on a toilet, but we do know that it happened reading Scripture and reflecting on the cross. And so let's do that right now. This is John chapter 19. If you're new, we've been preaching through the Gospel of John, and we ended last time around verse 16. The, the Jews have just brought Jesus to Pilate. Uh, and you remember that uh, the Jews didn't go into Pilate's palace. Why? Because they were afraid of becoming unclean. Pilate sentences Jesus, and Matthew records that Pilate washes his hands. In fact, there's this old legend that Pilate's ghost continually washes his hands because he, he just can't get clean. It's not finished. It's a legend. Well, in 1916, chapter 19, verse 16, Pilate delivers Jesus to crucifixion. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called, uh, the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. 
There was a legend that the skull of Adam was buried in this place. And, and still today, many Orthodox Jews, they think that Jerusalem is the site of old Edom, Eden. And, and, and John has told us, and he, and he will tell us later in the chapter, that in this place there was a garden. And in this garden there was a tree. And upon that tree they would nail the eschatos Adam. Verse 18. There they crucified him. And with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom, just like the robe of the high priest. And you remember that Jesus is our high priest, seamless. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now the scripture that John quotes is Psalm 22. And this is interesting because Psalm 22 was the scripture that really sparked the Reformation for Martin Luther. Psalm 22 starts with this line, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Luther read that in the Wittenberg Tower and realized that Jesus had unfectum. He realized that on the cross, Jesus experienced unfectum, but it must not be his own unfectum because he was sinless. It must have been Luther's unfectum. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all record Jesus saying that first line on the cross. But John records that Jesus fulfilled the psalm and then spoke the last line. This is how Psalm 22 ends, verse 31. He has done it. Perfect tense. In other words, it is finished. Verse 24. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, To fulfill scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. Now, hyssop's a rather strange thing to mention at this point, except for the fact that God commanded the Israelites to take hyssop branches, dip them in blood, and then spread that blood over their doorposts on the Passover. And John has made it very clear that Jesus is our Passover lamb. Behold, uh, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You know, if he takes away the sin of the world, I mean, that sounds like there aren't many sins left to take away. Next verse. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. Maybe, thought Luther, <clears throat> unfectun is finished. It is finished. Have, have you ever asked this question? Well, what is it that's finished? Well, number one, sacrifice. It is finished is, is one word, to telestai, from telos, the noun, and teleo, the verb. Uh, to an accountant, to telestai meant paid in full. Hebrews 7, 27. Jesus has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins, and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. You, you know, when we come to the communion table, we participate in Christ's death 
and resurrection. And yet Luther saw that Jesus was sacrificed once for all. It is finished. That means that Jesus has already paid for any sin that you might commit tomorrow. That means you can't earn grace with, with a really, really good confession. You know, I'm so sorry that you can't earn it that way. Well, that means grace already happened. And that means you can't make yourself any cleaner than, than you already are. That means you can't make God love you any more than he already does. That means God cannot be disappointed in you or disillusioned in you. He's already made up his mind about you. He has already decided, I am proud of you. It is finished. And so now what remains? Only to believe. Faith. We have only to, to, to reckon, lagizomai, consider, to recalculate. Romans 6, 11. Listen, consider yourself, reckon yourself <clears throat> dead to sin. Nothing to pay, nothing to hide. Dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3. Paul writes that he considers the, the work of his flesh, reckons the work of his flesh uh, to be crap. <laughs> And check this out. The work, <clears throat> digestion, of our flesh really is crap. Count sin as crap. Actually, Paul lists all of his good religious deeds done under the law with anfectun. He writes, I count them as scubala. And the, and the Greek word is abundantly clear. It should be translated shit. Sin is shit, argues Paul in the Bible. And so reckon yourself. Dead to sin, and your sin as, as shit. I mean, why did I want to potty train my kids? Why did I do that? Because I'm neurotic? No, I don't think so. It's because I love my kids, and I don't want my kids to live their life with scuba in their pants. Sin is crap. And when you see it, you'll stop crapping yourself. Sin is death and hell. When you see it, you'll want to let it go. Sin is crucifying the way, the truth, the life, the light, and love himself. And when you see him hanging on the tree, you will not want to do it ever again. But make no mistake. It's already been paid for. It is finished. And so it is sacrifice for sin. And it is the judgment. John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. And when I be, be lifted up, it is sacrifice all, all, uh, for sin, all sin. It is sacrifice. It is judgment. And it is wrath. If he takes away the sin of the world, what's there to be angry about? Revelation 15. John sees seven angels with seven bowls. The bowls contain blood, and it must be the blood of the lamb. And listen to what John writes. With them, the wrath of God is finished. Teleo. As the seventh bowl is poured out, John hears a loud voice from the throne. And remember, the slaughtered lamb sits on the throne. And remember, Jesus was enthroned upon the cross. The loud voice cries, it is done. It's finished. It's ended. You see, God's wrath has an end, a, a telos, a perfection, a goal. So God is not at all interested in endless wrath or endless torment. In the bowls is, is blood. And that blood is wine, and that wine is grace, and that grace is fire. It's endless fire. When we resist it, it burns. But the burning is not endless. The wrath has a purpose. The wrath has a telos. The wrath has a goal. When we resist, it burns. But when we surrender, we're home. Our God is an endless fire. And our God is our eternal home. Revelation 20, 14, listen to this. King James Version. Death and hell were thrown into the lake of fire. And 21, 4, death shall be no more. It is finished. It is sacrifice, wrath, death, hell, and time. Time, this time, chronological time. Check this out, Revelation 10, 6. At the seventh seal, seventh thunder, seventh trumpet, the mystery of God will be fulfilled, and chronos, that's the Greek, chronos, 
time will be no more. 1 Corinthians 10, 11, Paul writes, On us the end, the telos, of the ages, the times, on us the end of the ages has come, past tense. Hebrews 9, 26, He has appeared once for all at the end of the ages, the end of the times, to put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. Ephesians 1, 10, This is the plan for the fullness of time. Time has a fullness. The plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Christ. Colossians 1, 20, To reconcile to Himself all things, making peace by the blood of His cross where he cried, it is finished. It is time. It is creation. John just said so. We read it too fast. You didn't hear it. Verse 28. Knowing that all was now finished. You know, all is a very simple word. You know what all means? All. All. All means all in like any language, unless, of course, the context tells you differently. Jesus is quoting Psalm 22, so this is the context. This is how the psalm ends. Listen, verse 27. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall worship before him. For kingship, kingdom, belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generations. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to people yet unborn that he has done it and Jesus cried from the cross it is finished the Word of God from the tree in the garden at the end of the sixth day I wish we had time to review all those sermons from Genesis so you could see how true this really is. But according to Scripture, and maybe even according to Einstein's laws of physics, we exist in God's sixth day of creation. Until we come to the cross and believe the Word of God as He cries, it is finished, and enter God's rest the seventh day. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. It is finished. All is finished. The works of God finished by the Word of God. In the Revelation at the seventh seal, seventh thunder, seventh bowl, and seventh trumpet, John hears the one on the throne whose blood forms a river, the river which covers the earth. He hears, Behold, I make all things new. And write this down, for these words are faithful and true. And then John writes, And he said to me, it is done. It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the telos, the end. The end. John 19.30, to tell us die. It is finished. And, and now you may be thinking, and in fact, I kind of hope you're thinking, well, excuse me, Peter, but that was um, 2,000 years ago that he said, it is finished. And, and I'm sorry, I, I don't know what planet you happen to be from, but I happen to be from this planet. And just look around. It is not finished. This place is screwed up. Yeah. I, I know what you mean. But this is what Scripture says. At the cross eternity, eternal life, the kingdom of God invaded time. Time has a beginning and time has an end, a telos. And at the cross we come to the end. And the end is love. Burning hot eternal, unquenchable love. Love that cannot fail, for we have already seen it win on a cross. For as long as we run from the cross of Christ, the Lamb upon the throne, we trap ourselves in darkness, lies, death, and hell, this age, this time, this earth, this world. But when we surrender at the cross, we're born from above, and an eternal seed is implanted in our hearts, implanted in our hearts. And, and so 
what's our problem? Because <coughs> there is a problem, right? What's our problem? Well, it's always been the same problem. Always. You know, the tree of knowledge didn't make Eve sin. Have you ever thought about that? The tree of knowledge didn't make Eve sin. The tree of knowledge revealed sin in Eve. Sin is, is a void. Sin is the absence of faith. Faith had not yet been created in Eve. So Eve didn't trust that God finished it and that God finished her. And so Eve tried to finish herself and create herself in God's image. Listen closely. Faith is trust in God and God is love. Faith in love is a good free will. An absence of faith in love is a bad will. It's sin. And sin is a trap. That's why Martin Luther wrote a book called The Bondage of the Will. It's a trap because you cannot create goodwill with bad will. You cannot create faith in love with fear of love. And our God is love. So good free will is a gift. Faith is a gift. Jesus cried, it is finished. And, and what is it that is finished? Sacrifice, judgment, wrath, death, hell, time, creation, and most of all, you. You are finished at the cross with faith. And so check this out. Sorry for yelling. This just gets me excited. But the, the, the cross doesn't judge your faith. At the cross, God creates your faith. The cross judges your faithlessness and creates your faithfulness, your life. And check this out, Jesus is your life. Hanging on a tree, the tree of life. All creation, all space and time is a stage to bring you to the cross. Where what happens? You surrender your unfecting and, and you see that Jesus bears it and wears it. And that covered in filth, he cries out from your filth, it is finished. Bows his head, delivers up his spirit, that spirit which is sent into your dark heart like an eternal seed crying, Abba! Daddy, Father, that's faith. And in the Wittenberg Tower, studying scripture, Luther understood justification by faith. Not that God judges like the quality of our faith, but that God makes us just. He makes us righteous. He makes us right. He makes us perfect with faith. So faith is reckoned as righteousness. Why? Because it is. Because it is. Faith is reckoned as righteousness because it is. Then I grasp that the justice of God is that righteousness by which through grace and sheer mercy God justifies us through faith, writes Luther. Thereupon I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. The whole of scripture took on a new meaning. And whereas before the justice of God had filled me with hate, now it became so to me, became to me inexpressibly sweet in greater love. For faith leads you in and opens up God's heart and will that you should see pure grace and overflowing love. That, this is, this is to behold God in faith. That you should look upon his friendly heart in which there is no anger nor ungraciousness. He who sees God as angry does not see him rightly, but looks only on a curtain. Remember the curtain in the temple? Looks only on a curtain as if a dark cloud had been drawn across his faith. We, uh, his face. We see that was the start of the Reformation. I think we're due for another Reformation. Faith and grace. And faith by grace. Satan does not want you to see grace. And so Satan does not want you to see your sin. And if you see your sin, he'll try to keep you from the throne where you'll see your sin on Jesus. That is, you'll see grace. 
But now your father, what does your father want? He wants you to see your sin. So that you can see his grace. And trusting that you are forgiven much, you'll love much. You see, we're not only saved by grace through faith once, but we live by grace through faith every moment. The life I now live in the flesh, writes Paul, I live by the faith of the Son of God, or faith in the Son of God, uh, faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Hebrews 4, 16, Let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So holiness is not neurosis. Did you think it was? And fear is not faith. Holiness is faith in your father. Holiness is trusting your father. He is your Abba Daddy. That's what Abba means. It means Daddy. And you see, that changes everything. For most of all, Daddy's delight in faith. 23 years ago, this next week, August 26th, I became a Daddy for the very first time. It pretty much cured me of all poo phobia that, that, that I had. I mean, really, I began to wear this stuff like cologne, like a, like a fragrant offering. I didn't commit the sin, but I wore it. I wore it for the love of my kids. Jonathan was our oldest. And that whole neurotic system of rewards and punishment, fire trucks and songs sung in approval and disapproval, the law... <clears throat> well, it just wasn't working. And so Susan found this book called Potty Training in a Day. And she had this theory that I should be the one to train Jonathan since we shared a similar plumbing system. So she uh, took uh, baby Elizabeth, went shopping for the day, and left me alone with Jonathan and any uh, remaining poophobia that I may, that may have had uh, at the time. Well, Jonathan and I, we spent the morning together, and we really had a, a wonderful time, but as expected, at a certain point, Jonathan had an accident, a rather sizable accident, and according to the book, it was my job to take Jonathan into the, to the bathroom and put the poo-poo in the potty and put John on top of the potty and make him sit there anyway, thus showing him that hiding the dirty deed was just futile. Well, anyway, I, I remember I took John in by the hand. He was wearing this little white shirt, very white shirt and white underwear. I remember I walked him in and I, I stood him right there uh, before the throne, before the toilet, and, and, I, and I, uh, I pulled down his, his little white underwear things uh, like this. And then I remember kind of like trying to control him. I, I reached back over here to get some toilet paper or something, and I glanced back just in time to see this. Little Jonathan looks left, he looks right, then he reaches down, and with his hand, he grabs his accident. He, he grabs the visible expression of his sin nature. And then he stood up and he just hurled it at the toilet, and it, and it hit the lid, lifted up on the tank like a backboard, bounced off the lid into the bowl, two points. And then I remember he turned and looked at me, and his eyes just got so big, he was so thrilled with what he did for me. And, and then, then as, as he's looking at me, he, he takes his dirty hand, and uh, he starts wiping it across his clean white shirt, smiling the whole time as his eyes sparkle with joy, as if to say, Daddy, I did it for you. Daddy, are you not proud of me? <laughs> to his anal retentive friend, Philip Melanchthon, Martin Luther once said, sin boldly. I think he meant live like little Jonathan Hyatt. Come boldly before the throne of grace and live boldly in the knowledge of your Father's grace. And so John stood there before the throne, smiling at me as if to say, Are you not proud of me? And I was. <laughs> and I always will be. Not because he got the poo-poo in the potty. Not because of his deed. His deed was literally, in the words of Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, soiled undergarments. I wasn't proud of his deed. I was proud of him. His faith. Our faith. 
His eyes sparkled with faith in me, and his faith I reckoned as righteousness. It's finished. That's my judgment. That's what I wanted. Faith. My son, covered in filth, but full of faith. I would gladly handle all the filth to see just a mustard seed of faith. You know, God has quite literally done everything. All in order to handle your filth. All in order that you might have faith in grace. Your Father is grace. In Jesus' name, believe the gospel. And so on the night that he was delivered up, he took bread and he said, This is my body broken for you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper and having given thanks, he took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. And so now, in the name of Jesus, come boldly before the throne of grace. Come boldly and surrender your filth and be filled with faith. You are filled with faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Dark cup is wine. Light cups is juice. They are both the life of the living God. So, Lord Jesus, we worship you. And, Lord Jesus, we thank you for creating faith in us. For you create that faith with your very own blood and your very own body and through the power of your Spirit. And Lord God, we confess to you that we have taken credit for our own creation, but you are a good creator. And so, Lord, we thank you even for our faith. And Lord God, sometimes I get confused about my faith. Is it my faith? Is it your faith? Is it you believing inside of me? Is it me believing? And I wonder, well, whose faith is that? And Lord Jesus, last night I was thinking, well, I don't know. Does it matter? Everything is grace. Everything is grace. And you are good, and we are yours. And even here in this fallen world, we can live in the seventh day. We can rest because of you. Thank you, Lord God, for your unspeakable, unstoppable, unquenchable love in our Lord Jesus. We pray these things. Amen. Hey, it's me. I hope the sermon was helpful to you. hope it convinced you just a little more of God's love for you and uh, His power to transform um, your life and this entire world. God does love this uh, entire world. That's the city of Denver right out there. We're standing up in the... Um, bell tower of the place I normally preach loves Denver loves Cairo loves Moscow loves Beijing he loves the whole thing and died for the whole thing and he's called us uh, to proclaim his message of grace and reconciliation and redemption and uh, it's something that we hope to do through this website so we don't want to um, charge for messages uh, but we want to in invite you to uh, give to this endeavor please don't feel like you have to but but if you want to um, we sure would encourage it and you can do so just by pressing on that donate button on the website or by sending your um, donations into in here to the um, sanctuary downtown but uh, God bless you, and thanks for being a part of this ministry. I want to remind you, if there's someone that you want to send this message to, um, you can just email them, tell them about it, and invite them to listen. So, God bless you, and uh, believe the gospel. Amen.